a part of what has bothered so many people, you know, I have dear loved ones that have been bothered and felt like we're caving in to the liberals and we're caving in to the United Nations and Bill Gates. To both of them, I say, you know, maybe we're being myopic. You know, what would happen if in the last two years, and I know I'm using this as a comparison, what would happen if the church had been like, we're going to stand up against all evil, all secret combinations, whatever they are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this continuing discussion with Jacob Hess. Jacob, thanks for joining us. Yeah, great to be back. Well, hey, uh, we wanted to have a discussion. We've been talking back and forth with each other over the past few weeks. And one subject that you and I had been talking about, I thought would be worth kind of having on the podcast to, to go over, because uh, it's one that I think we, we deal with, and that's sort of this idea of contention. And, and to start off, I want to actually read the verses because there's sort of this idea of in the church and in our culture of contention is of the devil, right? And I, I want to actually read the verse that's most often cited, and it's, and it's the Savior talking in 3 Nephi 11, verses 29 and 30. And he says, For verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hath the spirit of contention is not of me, but is of the devil who is the father of contention, and he stirreth up the hearts of men to contend with anger one with another. Behold, this is not my doctrine, to stir up the hearts of men with anger one, with, one against another, but this is my doctrine, that such things should be done away. And so, I love that verse, and I hate that verse. <laughs> because I love it because I think it's absolutely true, and I hate it because I think people totally misunderstand it. Um, and what I wanted to do today with you was explore this idea of contention and, and kind of compare and contrast our feelings about it and what the scriptures say about it and things like that. So to get started, um, you know, is contention always of the devil? Is there any such thing as, as, you know, acceptable contention? Uh, let me ask you this, um, maybe a question for your question. How, before, before we go there, how do you feel people misunderstand the verse? So, I think we get this idea where, I, I kind of put it this way, people treat the, or have a vision of the Savior that Jesus was Barney the Dinosaur. Where it's, I love you, you love me, and everyone just dances around, and everyone's happy, and, the, and he never said anything that was contentious. Because the reality is, if there was one thing I would sum up Jesus' life, was it was a life of contention. He was the one who said, I come not to bring peace, but a sword, and the enemies will be those of your own household. And like, you'll be hated and persecuted for me. And it ultimately, the contention that he created was the reason that he was crucified. So far as I can tell from the New Testament narrative, at least a particular view of contention. And then you have Jude, who, who literally says, tells the saints to contend. He actually uses that language, at least in the King James Version, to contend for the faith. And so, it, it becomes this, wait a minute, Jesus says contentions of the devil. Yet we see all of this contention in Scripture and prophets leading to all sorts of contention. So, what are we to yeah. make of it? I wonder if you could back up for a moment and, and talk about something I know that we, we both are concerned about. Um, so, language <clears throat> is being weaponized in a lot of ways. And maybe the most obvious example is love. That word love. Mm-hmm and compassion and uh inclusivity like um and, and the opposite hatred mm -hmm. they've clearly uh for thousands of years there have been many different views of what love is but in our modern era there's like it's taken for granted we all know what love is supposed to be and when people ask us are you a loving person uh, it's not so simple, right? It's like, mm -hmm. are you an inclusive person? Are you a compassionate person? So I bring up that example to say, I think it's very helpful for us to draw a finer point and say, well, what do you mean by love, right? 
Mm-hmm. Are you open to different understandings of love? Because there's this view of love in the scriptures of charity, right? And it's more than just making you feel good. Yeah. In fact, charity might entail saying something that makes you not feel good. Yeah. I mean, as, as crazy as that sounds. And charity. So there's a radically different view of love that's not acknowledged. And I would say this, I, I bring that up because I think the same thing is operative uh, here. Mm-hmm. And in other words, too. Um, but we, we say conflict or we say, um, you know, we, 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 we use words and then it's like, um, so here, wh- wh- where this is going is just like there's a, there's a word that is more specific than love that's very useful. I feel like when it comes to conflict, which is the overarching one, contention is a word that the Savior in that um, verse does define pretty clearly. So the spirit of contention. There is someone who's the father of contention. And um, I think an important word there also is this idea of contending with anger. Yes, yes. Because yes. he doesn't say contention. At, this, he uses the word at, anger. Yeah, that points at something else. But I would, I would caution against describing the Savior's life as a life of contention, like as if it, his, he, I would say the truth that he brought, you know, stirs up darkness and other people brought. Um, so for me, contention is the, the word to describe what we are to not do. But there mm-hmm. is another word that, I, that I've been writing about with um, Randy Paul and Arthur Pena, who is a gay Christian libertarian Marxist, right? I, mm-hmm. I don't agree with him. But <laughs> we've been arguing that we need to get better at what Randy calls contestation, which is different than contention. Okay. Contestation, you think of a sporting match, right? Contestation yeah. meaning we need to be able to grapple over what is true and not be so fragile about it and not be so quick to run away and say, you hurt my feelings. <laughs> yeah. And we're not good at this and we're getting worse at it every day. But our ability to disagree in healthy ways and grapple is eroding. And I know that you and I share this deep concern because what does it mean if we lose the ability to do this? And yeah. how does that whole thing get weaponized when those of us who are trying to share truth with the world automatically get responses that say, well, you're just not being loving. You just don't have enough empathy. You're making me uncomfortable. You're being hateful. Frankly, it doesn't matter how sensitive and thoughtful and careful I have been. Mm-hmm. That's always the response, right? It doesn't mm-hmm. mean that it doesn't matter. Like it, mm-hmm. it, I think the Savior still does want us to do our best in that. But clearly we're in an atmosphere that makes it hard to say anything. So, 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 so it sounds like what, what you're getting at is, is this idea that we are mixing up the, the language that we're using is not precise. It's very, yeah. it's very vague. And, and the problem is you say love, you say empathy, you say that stuff. It means different things to different people. Yeah. I, I actually, I'm, I'm a big Jordan Peterson fan. Everyone knows that. And one of the, the I actually was just in Salt Lake City watching uh, his actual live talk that he gave there. And it was all about not hiding things in the fog. Mm-hmm. And language can be foggy. And yeah. foggy language allows people to basically make the language be whatever they want it to be. Yeah. Right? So all of a sudden, love isn't something concrete. It's kind of whatever you want it to be. And in that case, for most people, that's universal affirmation. It's affirmation of my behavior yeah. and, and my, my chosen self-perceptions. And so I think that being specific and clear in our language is massively important in a world that's muddling it. But the problem is, is that people don't like that. They like to be in the vagary. And if you yeah. push them to be more specific, it threatens them because they recognize a lot of the times, if you really push people to get specific, you'll find that they don't, there's not much there, there. They haven't actually thought about it. Well, and the vagueness is strategic. I mean, the, the reality is um, some of the sexual agendas out there have 
have advanced pretty powerfully by not differentiating different ways of thinking about love. It's been, it's been strategic and advantageous. So it, coming back to contention, I was, my proposal is that thing that is, um, that is an alternative to contending with anger. We need to call something else. We, we, mm-hmm. sh- I, I don't think we should call it anger. I don't think we should call it contention because of what the Savior says about the spirit of contention and who is yeah. the Father, the Spirit. Of... So just just in terms of our, but discourse... there is, but there is a differentiation. There. I think you and I both we can we can agree here. Okay, so there is a line here that exists between what we will call contestation, let's say, yeah, and then the line between contestation and contention and contention. Yeah. But but let's let's kind of define that and flesh that out a little bit. So contention is the thing that we don't want. What are the characteristics of contention and what is that distinction between those two categories? Well, Arthur Brooks wrote a great piece um, a while back where he, he kind of zeroed in on the defining feature of the kind of destructive version as contempt. Like Mm. think of, think of, uh, I I like to return to family disagreements because it's something we can all understand. Think about the radical difference between a conflict where you're grappling um, over something that matters with or without contempt. Yeah. I just, I just had a, you know, some dear friends split up, you know, their, their marriage fell apart. And, and when contempt enters into a marriage or to, into our national conversation, it's, it's like, it's pretty toxic. Versus, how do you, how do you, would you, oh, let me just add to that another word because contempt I, I definitely agree another one that i might add and maybe it's the same thing is resentment oh yeah so this, this idea of contempt resentment like an yeah. enmity towards the person is that enmity. is that kind of yeah but and but but my question is this so to push back on that but aren't we supposed to have contempt for certain ideas yeah we're supposed to hate sin I mean, hatred is, is there for a reason. There's a, there's a reason we have all these emotions. And I would say the same thing about fear. It's really popular to say, we're not supposed to fear anything. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, and, and anger, getting back to anger, there's also a version of anger that's righteous. We see it throughout scripture, but I like to call it indignation. Like there's a righteous... Um, and I want to I throw this out there, Jacob. It does seem to me... I know a lot of Latter-day Saints are listening in, other, others who aren't Latter-day Saints, but it does seem to me we're learning slowly, falling on our face sometimes, how to have emotions like our, like our Father in Heaven, like who feels mm. sorrow in a godly way, who feels anger or indignation in a godly way, you know, and, and, and I feel like all these emotions have a place, Right. And, and yeah, maybe about, one of the, of the, the Barney thing you described is like, no, we're not supposed to ever feel that. And we're always supposed to feel, you know. Um, so I took us a little far afield. I don't know where. We're... No, no, I, I was, I was just going to say that as we're comparing these two contention versus contestation, sort of what we might call the healthy version and the unhealthy version and where the lines and the principles are that govern between those. Yeah. Is... Another angle of that that I've considered, because I, I agree with you, uh, there, there is, I have looked at it this way, contempt, hatred, all of those things, if they are pointed at a person, at you, Jacob Hess, I hate you, that is wrong. And that is fundamentally, that is, the, that is enmity between you and I as children of God, and that is the essence of what Satan is about is creating enmity between us and God, where God is trying to create union. Now with that in mind. So, so the question becomes, well, where is the proper placement for that anger? And it seems to me or a possible way of thinking about it. And that I've, as I've pondered this, I'm trying my best to figure it out. Like where are these lines between, you know, where do things like anger and contention and, and like uh, righteous indignation, like where is the healthy outlet for them? For me, that's kind of where I created this distinction between you and your ideas. Like if you think that we should exterminate all the Jews, 
I am right to be contempt, have absolute and utter contempt for that idea, right? While still loving you in this sense. Like, I still love you in that I still, there's a great, I think it's Aquinas' definition of love, which has been my favorite, is sort of this idea that I still will your good. I want you to reach your highest potential. And the reason I want for those ideas that you're holding to be destroyed is because those i it is because i love you that i don't want those ideas to take root in your heart and yeah. corrupt your soul yeah i mean i think i think on principle we're, we're really in agreement the way i like to describe it is thoughtful good-hearted people disagree about a lot of important things and when we when we realize that we can arrive at a place where um we have a lot of love and even affection for people whose ideas we find really dangerous. Um, you know, I, my conversation partners range across all sorts of ideas and they all think my, my ideas are nuts. They do. They think <laughs> not as crazy as they thought once, but they still think they're crazy, <laughs> but I feel affection from them. Right. And, and so, but we, but we disagree vociferously. But what I want to suggest is, in practice, what you just described, there is an art to it. Because let, let's imagine you went home tonight after the interview and you're like, "Hun, you know how I feel about you. Your ideas about the culinary arts are, I, I hold in contempt. You know, like, <laughs> there's a way in which a contempt for someone's ideas can feel pretty personal sometimes. Well, it so, can because our ideas ultimately become part of our of our identity and yeah, who, we, who, who we feel that we are. But but I would I mean that's sort of a separate conversation to some extent. But, but that's that's where I would say the art is 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 like section one twenty one showing an increase in love afterwards, lest they esteem you as an enemy, right? How do we go there on the things that matter in a way that people do not mistake us to be enemies? I, I, mean, well, I mean, I think this is a profound practice. It really is. And I, it involves, it, you know, when I knock on, on my neighbor's door, who's not a member of the church and is a former member of the church, you know how the conversations go. It's like, yeah, there's like, a, there's a deep resistance. And I found like, I need to say things like, Hey, I'm your neighbor. This is not step two in a five-step process. I, I want to know you. Yeah, your, your, your love for them is genuine, right? And yeah. that's something of like, but, but what's really funny is that that's what the scriptures actually say is where our real priesthood power comes from, is from love unfeigned. In other yeah. words, genuine love. It means you actually care about that person. It's like, you're not doing this for some reason to check some box. Like you're actually doing it because you just plain old love them and you care about them and you're interested in them. And that, and and that i mean that kind of love changes lives like it does but but there is a challenge here because when because context matters big time for the like the tactics that you'll use right so if i am meeting like people are really surprised by something when they actually get to know me on a personal level like they're like you're way nicer and way more like reasonable in person than maybe you are in my online persona that they see. Okay. And, and I, I get this over and over from people and, but there's a reason for it. It's because when I'm interacting with you one-on-one -on -one, and we're having a, a private conversation, like there's no audience there. We're not in the public square standing on our soapboxes pontificating to the society the way that the world should be. You know what I'm saying? We are one-on-one -on -one at the dinner table together having a, 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 a conversation between us. And it doesn't make any sense for me to debate you because at a dinner table, there's no one there to, you know, there's no audience. And, and a debate ultimately is a, isn't about the person you're debating with. Like, you know, the presidential debates are not about them convincing each other of their arguments. It's so that the people who watch, but that's the way the public conversation happens. And so to kind of frame this, because this is something that I think you and I, like, I'd be more interested in seeing the areas where that are less clear, because I think you and I, when it comes to what I, what I call like ministering, like when you're ministering to someone who's your neighbor next door, 
mm-hmm. you know, and individual people. You're the what you're the way you're going to go about this is totally different than within the public square of conversation. And yeah. where the I find that when people actually get together, we all talk about how contentious and polarized everyone are. When you actually put them all into a room, everyone actually gets along incredibly well. They yeah. all hate each other in the abstract, not in the personal, right? And so when people actually get to know each other, which is part of the problem. Sorry if I'm on a little rant here, but if everyone's getting off on this um or because of our sort of digital age that we live in and the lack of individual connection, the dialogue now is much worse because you're not actually dealing with people. But that's the sandbox that we're in. The public conversation has shifted to sort of online dialogue. And the question is, is within that space, there are ideas now that are truly abhorrent and they're spreading like wildfire and causing immense problems, uh, in in my opinion, to the social fabric. Yeah, for sure. No question about it. And so I guess my question is, is as we approach that conversation, the public dialogue, right? Because that's where I would say most of the contention is, not in the direct interpersonal relationship within that as a disciple of christ right where is the line between you know am i being contentious if i rigorously challenge and i mean and and even and and uh, like can i mock a bad idea can i drop a meme that makes fun of the idea that a man can be a woman. I'm not attacking trans people. I love trans people. But this idea is spreading like a contagion to young people. Are we really supposed to be so upset that we, that we made a, 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 that we dropped a meme that, that made fun of the idea just because there are people who believe, who hold that idea as, as quasi sacred. Do you, you see the the problem? It's like we in this conversation. It is a real battlefield of ideas. Are we forced to tie one of our hands behind our back when going after false ideas because it might hurt feelings? And I I want to say, I actually think there is a limit. There is a line. I just struggle to figure out where that is. And you struggle for good reason. I mean, I. Before we dive in, let me just validate a little bit that um, I've been sitting with the questions you you shared with me, and one thing that's coming up is one of the reasons this these conversations are so hard is it's more than a life or death issue. Like for people of faith, this goes way beyond life or death. This is. Um, this I had a buddy leave the church recently and I I texted him that this is how it felt. It felt like somebody who I had a warm, loving connection with. A black sedan had pulled up in front of him and put a bag over his head and shoved him in the back of the seat and drove off. And every once in a while I get texts from an undisclosed location letting me know that he's <laughs> Still alive. I shared that with him because that's the feeling. That's no exaggeration. It mm-hmm. feels like a hijack. It feels like, um, like this is war. And so all the strong emotions we just described, the fear, the anger, the sorrow, I, I just want to say very clearly, we are not out of bounds to feel all of that. I do think there's a godly version and an ungodly version, you know, Mm -hmm. there's like a really destructive version of fear and, and, and sorrow that becomes despair and anger that becomes this toxic brew of resentment, but there's a godly version. Right. And I, and I think part of what we're talking about is how to hold these emotions in a godly way. And then what do we do about them? Right. That's Mm -hmm. where you're pushing us to go next. So I can't help but think about this conference weekend we just finished. I know this will go up and it'll be sometime down the road, but I admit there's a part of me that would love to see uh, an Old Testament version of prophets stand up 
<laughs> in the mold of Tucker Carlson and go, you think this is bad? Just wait. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Like we are in a war with vicious, cruel forces, you know, and, and we've got to fight with everything we've got. And, you know, you know, I, we don't know how much longer we'll even be able to send out missionaries, let alone worship in the temples, let alone speak our minds. Right. And it, I admit, like, there's a part of me that kind of yearns for that. And you know, as well as I, that is an orthogonal contrast. That is a sharp contrast with what we experience at the feet of the prophets. And, and I find that really instructive. I find that really like it gives me pause because I have, I like you, I will pick up my sword and just dive in. And so we lose our lives. Who cares? <laughs> Let's go to war. Let's fight the good fight. But if we're taking cues from our, from these godly men and women, I do, I do find something remarkable about how countercultural their way of fighting is with, um, maybe the talk show, cable show hosts, you know? Yeah, no, and I, and, and just as a quick side note on that. So in this conference, um, it was interesting, like, like there were some talks that were, were very bold and very, uh, Absolutely. and straightforward. Um, I believe it was, um, brother Clay Bingat, I think you say, say his name. Um, I mean, he was, don't be apologetic. Like, stand yeah. up we can accept people but hate sin you know don't be dissuaded by the voices in the building that are whining and saying that you're being intolerant and insensitive elder bednar basically says heed not the people in the building you know that 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 are and and, and you know you, you know we were talking about sort of the people out there not everyone's a good faith actor yeah. okay people have yeah. like you're saying strategic ends that they're trying to achieve but i think yeah. we do have to be very careful in in not in 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 knowing who that is and who that isn't. Now, with that yeah. said, with that said, um, the I have often th so there's a lot of people right now who politically are on more of the right who are and I consider myself very solid dead center of the conservative movement. I don't consider myself really far right, but I don't consider myself like a more liberal conservative. I'm like right dead in the middle of it, and I would say that there are a lot of members right now, even in my camp, who feel a level of like, why aren't the brethren saying more when the world is turning and getting so crazy? Yeah. But I, whenever I have this happen, um, and I have family members who are this way, whenever I see that happen, I can't help but think back to the Savior, who, yeah, he was rough on the Pharisees, that's true. But Think about how he, who were the biggest oppressors in the world during Christ's time? It was the Romans. Like, the Messiah was supposed to come and just start lopping off some Roman heads. Yeah. And Jesus shows up, and he's telling people to turn the other cheek. And he's like, wait, what? Like, all of a sudden, Jesus has this very different kind of approach towards the, the political oppressors. So, Christ, when it comes to politics, it was very clear. He, he's playing a much deeper game than politics. But also, he was playing the religious game. But that's why, and, and I, I, I kind of tell people this. Look, I, I try and model myself after the Savior. And so far as I can tell, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this to see if I'm off. But I try and follow the Savior. And the Savior's pattern of behavior as it related to kind of the general population was very tolerant. It was, he was very tolerant towards sinners. To his disciples, he was very rigorous in challenging them to do better and to sacrifice more. That was the, you notice that pattern. But towards those who perverted his teachings, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the insiders mm -hmm. that were perverting his faith. Mm-hmm that were altering his doctrine and his teachings. It's interesting that Jesus says those who commit sin and those who teach men so will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. And he modeled that in his life. Who did he go after hardest? He went after those 
who were on the inside, quote unquote, that were perverting the truth. And a lot of people, here's another quick thing. They falsely categorize Christ as a someone who challenged authority. But Christ was the authority. He was asserting his authority. And that is, you know, so it, it, it's a different framing, but I've always seen as, you know, the, the area that is the most dangerous in Christ, like what Christ saw as most dangerous, was the perversion of his gospel. Yeah. Well, let me, let me cite something that really validates, validates what you've said. I've reflected on this a lot. So at the end of Alma 5, Alma says, What shepherd is there among you having many sheep doth not watch over them, that the wolves enter not and devour his flock? And behold, if a wolf enter his flock, doth, if a wolf enter his flock, doth he not drive him out? Yea, and at the last, if he can, he will destroy him. So, you know, he goes on to ask us to suffer no ravenous wolf to enter among you. And, and to your point, Jacob, it does seem to me that we've sometimes allowed ravenous wolves to be among us because we don't want to hurt feelings and we don't want to, like, say anything that... What? And in today's environment, there's a mob waiting for you if you, if you, you know, those, those wolves have a whole bunch of other wolves that are yeah. around. So that is all absolutely true. And it's, it's painful to imagine what, you know, maybe people, we, people that could have been spared great loss had we confronted some of the ravenous wolves. Um, I know there's, there's a big podcaster I've sought to respond to. And I know that there were, there were people that could have done more that were dissuaded of it because they didn't want to hurt their careers. You know, like we've been too nice. We've been too. And so there is something important there. Like if somebody comes and threatens your family or mine, you know, we're not going to be nice. We're going to be fathers. We're going to be men and not, but there's, there's still this, this conundrum of conference and the brother. And I, I I wonder if we could go back there for a second. Um, Yeah. I wanted to say, um, by way of that question, when someone talks to you or I or any of us, what I would love is that certainly that they hear truth and that we have the courage to share it. And I want them to see in us a kind of joy and peace and um, kind of richness of life that is undeniable right? Mm -hmm. They might deny, they might say your ideas are crazy, but I can't deny what I see in your life. That's my experience with President Nelson. I -hmm. actually interviewed an an evangelical pastor, Francis Chan. He has the same thing. The man exudes joy. He just is so freaking excited about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And even people that think his ideas are off, you can't there's like this attraction to that, right? Yeah. That's, to me, the wisdom of the prophetic stance right now that people are not seeing. Those who want the prophets to be in either direction of politics, like more in line with, you know, fighting the good fight and like really taking it to the, the, the forces of evil. I, I don't think they realize how... Un, like how that could put how that can push people away and how sorry about that and and like we need to be a light that attracts people like if the people of god um lose the luster you know and this is i'm just paraphrasing the bible now uh-huh. but if 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 people look at us and they don't see hope and joy and peace where are they going to find it well, really well, and I would, here's, here's something I would say, and I, I really struggle with this, and I think others have as well. I shared with you a letter that someone had wrote to me about kind of this issue, but it's a, I also want to see a confidence in what they believe in and a clarity, because at the end of the day, it seems, and this is a, this is a broader trend. It isn't just in the church, it's in society generally. There's a trend towards, we don't know, we're not sure don't make bold claims, kind of temper your expectations, hypothesis only kind of stuff. And I, I understand that and I get that because I think that there's, there's the opposite approach. There's sort of the, the Brigham Young approach where it's just like, man, he's throwing down all sorts of stuff and 
some of it might be true, but a lot of it might not be. You know what I mean? But dang, he was confident in what he was saying. And there is, especially for those on the right, I think there is a psychological disposition towards wanting stability and order. And stability and order is predicated on confidence. A person who's like, yeah, like, this is what we believe. And no, we don't need to like shake or waffle or like, no, this is just the way it is. And I think that there's a level of clarity and security that comes with that. And there is this feeling among some of us, like, do we really believe in what we say we believe? And I'm not the only one to, and, and, and I believe that the brethren absolutely do, and I do, but it becomes like, why are we not more forceful yeah. about proclaiming that? And instead, seeming like we're trying to please people rather than to just speak the truth. Yeah. And, and real quick, I know that's a hard one because there's, there's truth and there's tone, you know, yeah. just because you're saying what's true. It doesn't matter if you're saying the truth, if you're saying it in a way that drives everyone away, like there is something to be said for how you say something. Yeah. So let me quote uh, John Eldridge. He's, um, he's a pastor who wrote a book called Wild at Heart. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I've, I've heard of it and I've heard a lot of good things about it. So the, a, a part of why that's a complicated question is we, we, we have seen a trend towards making anything that's overly masculine and an expression of masculinity a pe- pathologizing it like it's wrong yep. and we've feminized jesus i think sometimes to where he's he's just a lamb lover he's just really the nicest guy so this is from john says we've made jesus out to be tame we've fashioned jesus into an image we want god to have someone nice kind of like mr rogers except with a beard <laughs> <laughs> I, I always use Barney. I always use Barney the dinosaur, but Mr. Rogers is great too. Yeah, like, like, and, and and it's not only Jesus; it's the model for Christian men. What does it mean to be a Christian man? It means to be a nice guy. And this pastor uh, Eldridge, he he says it so well. He's like, that's just not inspiring to men. It's not. Yeah, it's not. Even if it were true, it doesn't rouse our faculties to fight for our families and to that, fight off pornography. And to we're fight. the church. We're the church of Moroni. I mean, like, yeah, are, yeah. The, there's only two people in Scripture that you're told to be like. One was like Jesus, and the other one was like Moroni. It basically says, like, look, if everyone could be like Moroni, <laughs> like the powers of hell would be hate, or the powers of hell would be shaken. And you're right, but instead we have this soft voiced. Mr. Rogers version of the savior where literally, and this, this, you want to drive me nuts when people use the word Christ-like as an synonym for be nice for yeah. it's just like, like, Whoa, you never read the new Testament. No, exactly. So, so Eldridge goes on to say, Jesus was not just a nice guy. He was dangerous. He uh-huh. was a dangerous man, which is why he was killed and followers of Jesus are also, you know, we need to be a little more brave heart. You know, I love that movie edited. I can't stomach the unedited version, <laughs> but like I get a spiritual experience when I watch man movies, my wife teases me about it. Like I'll go down. I like, I want to watch a Liam Neeson movie and then I'll come back and be like, I can go another day. You know, I can fight. Cause you don't see a lot of images, even all the Disney movies. Now you don't see images of, uh, you know, Men are not the strong, like a reminder that we can do the right thing, even if we don't feel like it. Now, I I don't mean to get too far down the, you know, masculinity conversation, because I know we share a lot of concerns. The point I want to make is, is um, that that is out there. And we are tempted to think that that's how we need to be. And we're tempted to think that the first and great commandment is to not offend. As long as you're not offending, you're good. And the weaponization of even offense to where uh, I've had people attending my presentations. I had a, (laughs) a trans individual in a presentation I gave on sexuality in the front row raises her hand and just describes how hurt she is by what I've, I've said. (laughs) And I'm only laughing because I'm like, 
what was she, what was this person expecting of me to do? To sit down, to apologize, to say, I recant everything I've just said because it's hurt you. <laughs> it's like, well, well that's, that is the, that's the game that we're in these days. We're in the, we're in the day where there is a mob waiting to shame you. If you say things that offend certain protected classes of people yeah. and they are, they literally want to stifle the ability for us to speak the truth. And the way I look at it is in today's culture if a mob is not coming from for you, to some extent, if you're engaged in the public conversation and there's not a mob after you, I, I'm i sorry. I don't think you're speaking the truth, or, or at least they're not seeing it, because if yeah. you speak the truth, it will make people upset. And that's what Jesus said would happen. Yeah. So, a- amen. The temptation here is to, in a, in kind of a morbid way, let the mob dictate what we do and kind of get so caught up in the mob energy. And I want to, speaking to those that are concerned with kind of how prophets have responded, I want to underscore that there is a remarkable power in, despite everything we're describing, speaking from a place of joy and peace and power. And, And are we afraid to say anything? No. But neither are we like caught up in all of the kind of the shadow wars, you know, like we kind of rising above it. I like how you said Jesus was playing a different, like he was fighting for a different kind of kingdom. I have been in conversations over the last several years with people who hold similar concerns about sexuality and health. You know, there's a lot of members that are concerned um, the church has yielded too much to prevailing health orthodoxy and others that are concerned the church is yielding too much to popular sociopolitical doctrines to both of them i have said the same thing and i want to i want to repeat i feel that the church of jesus christ can either fight the pharmaceutical industrial complex (laughs) or deliver the ordinance of exaltation to the world you can't do both. I would say the same thing. The church can either take on the, the social justice sort of conversion, because it's a religion, of America, right? Or it can deliver the ordinances of exaltation to the world. It can't do both. And so a part, a part of what has bothered so many people, you know, I have dear loved ones that have been bothered and felt like we're caving in to the liberals and we're caving in to the United Nations and Bill Gates. To both of them, I say, you know, maybe we're being myopic. You know, what would happen if in the last two years, and I know I'm using this as a comparison, what would happen if the church had been like, we're going to stand up against all evil, all secret combinations, whatever they are. And there's a, there's a lot of them. I, yeah, I there are. Recently, you know, like, <laughs> there, what are, would it there mean? are people in concentration camps right now, everybody. <laughs> what would it mean for our ability to attract everyone in the world? I, I would say there, there is more divine inspiration and strategy and wisdom behind the position of of prophet leaders and by the way it drives people on both sides of the political spectrum nuts that's a good sign that's actually a good sign (laughs) because we're drawing goodness from all directions right the time will come where we're going to have to pick up swords i believe in our defense even more but for now i i'll tell you what even when i felt the spirit confirming that the, the, the direction the prophets have been going, even when I feel some discomfort, I, there's a power yeah. to it. I've, I, have, I, I will echo this part of what you just said, that I myself have, uh, it's weird, I had a lesson that I learned on my mission. It was, when I ended my mission, it was kind of like, you have this, what do you think you're going to learn on your mission? And then there was what I actually learned on my mission. And it was shocking to me when I actually sat down the last day of my mission and I wrote this big journal entry about like, all right, I just completed a mission. Like, what am I thinking? And it was really weird. The thing that I learned more than anything out of my mission was the the concept of stewardship. 
and the concept of like you like my stewardship stay in my stewardship and allow the people in theirs to do theirs and it's okay to have opinions and things like my mission president had some rules that i never you know even to this day didn't like but i recognize that he had the prerogative to do that and not only that in some ways i've learned that there was wisdom in much of what he did that i didn't realize and then in addition to that like the church let's let's take this back to the church uh, and, and the brethren I look at people who are like, well, why, you know, we have a bajillion dollars, you know, the church is like a hundred billion dollars. They should be out like just giving money away hand over fist to every poor country in the world. And I kind of stopped and thought about that and that critique. And I realized, wait a minute, that's not the mission of the church. And in fact, there's already all sorts of institutions out there in the world that are doing that work. But there's only one institution out there building temples. And what's funny is that if people actually made and lived the covenants of the temple, poverty would dry up. Like yeah. the world's, the, the problems in the world could be so I was like, wait a minute, we're, what game are we playing? We're not playing, like that goes back to that, that, that analogy of the Savior and the Romans. The Savior wasn't playing that game. Yeah, we have to understand the game that we are playing is to get people to make covenants and live with Christ and and to follow Christ, and so I think I think you make a good point. I can I think there's some areas to push back on, but I I really like that idea of can the church go out and solve all the evil in the world? Like no, the the amount of horrible things that the church could be out campaigning against in the world is nearly endless. And that is not the mission of the church. Yeah. And not, but we can look forward to the day when it happens. Like when all the evil is vanquished, like section 123, there's one of the sections that talks about all the principalities, kingdoms coming together one day, kind of like that Marvel movie where all mm-hmm. the bad Things came together in one character. Yeah. One day, I think all the goodness in the world will be united in Zion. Like all, all the the overcoming of evil will be consolidated. But if it happened today, I don't know that anybody would be willing to be a part of it. <laughs> like yeah. you know, it's that old joke. If the prophet comes out and says, "We got to we got to lay off sugar," you know, like yeah. half the members would say, "See ya." Yeah, you know, like that's a joke, but it's not really a joke. It's like it's super hard to change your diet. So why doesn't the prophet? You know, I know people who are like bothered the prophet doesn't emphasize the word of wisdom more and help us to be more healthy. Well, you know, you're trying to move this big ship forward. Um, and ultimately, and ultimately, that but that kind of takes away from what the purpose of the church. And if you really think about it, actually, is it's actually to get us to make and keep covenants because if we do that, all of the rest of this emerges from that, from a personal relationship with God and a commitment to obey the commandments of God and to live your covenants, like Zion emerges from that. Zion is not something that 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 uh, is imposed externally from the outside forces of the church as the as the world does, where they you know use the social institutions to socially engineer. It's literally to say we're going to change you. And we're going to get a whole bunch of you that are like you together in the church, and we're going to keep making more people converted to Christ. And that's the and from that emerges the ideal society because there's no need for government in Zion because in in Zion people self regulate because they love God, they love one another. It's like why would you? You don't even like need cops. You don't need all these institutions because everyone just organically takes care of one another, and that is the vision of Zion. And by the way, it's like probably one of the biggest reasons I'm like a Latter Day Saint because the vision of Zion is like it's just look. It gets you fired up, man. It's like we're gonna go change I, the whole world. I got chills. I mean, I'm I, the good kind of chills. You know taking the slums out of the people rather than the people out of the slums. Yep. I mean, what you're describing is so beautiful compared to like the social justice version of Zion utopia, that what you described is so beautiful. And if you're right, and I think you are, and I think the spirit agrees that you are with what you said, then if the prophets did 
what the sort of angry people on both sides want them to do, it would be a distraction from Mm -hmm. the higher work. It would be like Jesus putting on the armor to go fight the Romans. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. We're 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 in it for the long game. And And, and, and that's why I say it's good versus evil, not left versus right. And there is goodness on both sides of the political spectrum. There is. Mm -hmm. And there's some real ugly things on both sides of the political spectrum. So I really think um, this is why the prophets are not conservative or liberal enough for either side, because they're trying to follow the Lord. Yeah, I think they they, they transcend that. They are dealing in the game of truth and falsehood, not the game of left and right. And and now, not to say that that doesn't translate over to the things that the left and the right are doing. There's a lot of over right or wrong they are and sometimes we all may want more clarity on certain things from the brethren and that's fine but the lord ultimately reveals to us what he wants to reveal and that is something that to me has become very apparent again going back to that example the savior and in other times it's like why doesn't why didn't jesus just go and lay waste to the romans and restore israel why it's like there's a different purpose to what's going on and i think a lot of it comes down to us like the whole point is like, who's supposed to go change the political system? You are. You're the one who's supposed to go out there and to figure these things out. It is you who are supposed to go out and to pick up the hands of the, the poor. It's not the church that's supposed to socially engineer these things from the outside. And it starts in this, this idea within Zion of stewardship. It's, just, it's, it's a profound concept because the world focuses on sort of these things at, like what does the church focus on you your family your ward your stake very inside out approach where what are all the kind of sjw's worried about social systems and all these vagaries of how they're going to re-engineer I, I everything an activist. right yeah and that and that just is not uh, but, but even but left or right or whatever it is, like the answer isn't found in politics. The answer to the problems lies in the heart of human people. Politics is downstream from culture, as people will say, and I believe that culture is downstream from the hearts of individual people. Beautiful, beautiful. Can I throw one more thing out about the line that we that we were discussing? I, I absolutely love what you've been saying here at the end. I think there's a lot of inspiration. Yeah, let's go back to it. Um, we've talked prior to this podcast about the comparison, like what pe- other people get away with and what, what is asked of us, right? I, I personally believe we just need to embrace that we have a higher standard we have to live up to. Like, mm-hmm. we say we're trying to follow the, the savior of the world, right? And the people that are doing these nasty things, and some of them are outright rejecting him, so I've noticed, you know, you, you, you talked about the mockery. Um, I did a video um, about this podcaster, and uh, there was a slight hint of some, some mockery, some sarcasm. And what I, what I noticed is people seized on that as evidence for their resentment towards me. And it just reminded me, I'm not, I'm not saying that there aren't ever times to kind of poke and prod, but it, it, it did remind me that there, there are really good reasons, psychologically speaking, for why we also need to be living that higher standard. It's not, it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but it's almost like evil just needs a little like, reason to... to attack and, and have the evidence and what i'm yeah, saying is let's not let's not give people evidence yeah don't, don't make it up they can make it up and they probably will but 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 it's pretty darn hard i have to put it this way it's pretty darn hard to argue that president russell nelson is a hateful man i mean you like you have to do psychological gymnastics yeah because he's not giving them a whole lot to go on right yeah no, and I and I agree. We have to. Uh, there's that. I've often thought of that idea of wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Right? A serpent is not like a dove. <laughs> right? A serpent will bite, yeah. but harmless as doves. You know, I, I've often looked at that, and 
And you're right, we don't want to give people ammunition. But I also would say this, and I push back just a little bit in this in this sense, is that you need to judge if we we all need to judge if what we are doing is consistent with what the Savior would have us do. And maybe in that instance, you felt that it was not consistent with the spirit that you think that you should convey in that. But I also would be careful that some people will manipulate people into feeling guilty for things that you don't need to feel guilty about. If you are speaking the truth and your heart is in the right place, then by all means, you do not need to apologize to the mob who says, you're hurting my feelings because you said something that was true. And, and here's the thing, it's, it's tough because you got to use some discernment here. There are people who you legitimately you know, need to be like, I'm not going to bring a trans person in, sit them down and just like, like tear into them on an ideology, just me and them. But if I'm in a public forum discussing, can a man be a woman? And someone comes up and says, hey, I'm trans. Uh, and you're a bigot, and you're causing people to commit suicide, and they engage in all of this kind of emotional blackmail, the proper response is to just look at them and be like, I'm sorry, you're, you're mistaken. Yeah. Like, like, you're not, like, when you kowtow, to, that's what they count on you doing. Yeah. They use that against you. So what they do is they hamstring your ability to actually say what's true. And so people don't say what's true. And the truths that are important truths are hidden away, and we have to act like they're not there because we are afraid of people taking offense at our words. And so, while I agree that sometimes we can cross the line, that line is not determined by, this, by the people's reaction. The line is determined by the Lord, and by if you have done anything wrong by Him. Yeah. And if you haven't, if you've spoken the truth directly and, and nothing you said was false and none of it was intended to hurt anyone, but maybe was intended to destroy a particular idea, like I have a very hard time ever feeling like that person needs to apologize, especially when so many today are bad faith actors who right, right, use right. emotional I mean, manipulation to win. I mean... Um... Yeah, this is the fraught context that we're that we're in. It's very difficult to speak. There's a silencing of the lambs. Most people are just being silenced. So, so how to speak? I think of the verse. You know, we need to speak the truth, but we need to speak in the spirit of the truth, which is what we've been talking about today. Yeah. And how to do that? God has to lead us. I mean, frankly, I, I don't think I, I, I sometimes wonder if anyone is capable of doing this without his help. Like we we need to be confident that God's going to be behind us. Yes. And, and so that we don't have to go in. We don't have to go in ourselves. Um, we, we have backup and, and we say what we need to say and only that much. And if we if we need to stop, we stop. You know, the Elder Anderson saying there's a time to not say something. Yeah. And um, and those those people that we are contesting with, I've I've sought to I've tried to pray for them more. And as I've tried to pray for them, shoot. As I pray for them, I feel more sorrow for them. Mm -hmm. I feel uh I see, I experience them as people who are just misguided and mistaken. Yeah. Sorely, you know, I feel bad for them. I, and, and, and I feel like my compassion is growing rather than the sort of um, you disgusting human being because you're fighting, you know, on the wrong side. So I do think as we pray for our enemies, another basic Christian teaching, God mm-hmm. can give us the kind of heart to engage with enemies of truth in his way and it's not easy returning full circle this is a this is an intense practice and and i would hope that people are inspired you know by by what you've said by what we've talked about maybe they felt a little more uh encouragement to raise their own voice and and to do it do it in his way you know if we do it in his way with his power you're right we can say anything 
Yeah. And I think that's going to depend on the context of the situation. I yeah. think that these things are incredibly context dependent. I think it's, it, we can talk in sort of the general principles, but until you get into the specific context, are you in the public square? Are you alone with someone? Is this someone that you are, that is, that is, that is a good faith actor? And how can you even tell if they are a good faith actor? You know, these kind of things have to be judged by the spirit and the dynamics of the situation. And it is hard. Um, thank you, Jacob. This has been rich. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. And, uh, I'll have to have on, have you on again sometime and everybody be sure to go check out public square mag.org. <laughs> Take care, Jacob. Thank you, brother. See ya. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and hit the subscribe button. Also, if you want more content, including the podcast, go to thoughtful-faith.com. Thanks for watching.